Airing first on Asheville FM in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. This week on the show, you'll be hearing a conversation with M. Walimu Shakur, a politicized new African revolutionary prison organizer incarcerated at Corcoran Prison in California. M. Walimu has been involved in organizing, including the cessation of hostilities among gangs and participants in the 2013 California and then expanded hunger strikes to protest solitary confinement without end uh, while he was at Pelican Bay Prison and helping to found the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee or IWOC plus liberation schools for self-education and he continues to mentor younger prisoners. He was in solitary confinement uh, including the SHU for 13 of his years of incarceration. For the hour, and Walimu talks about his politicization and organizing behind bars, his philosophy, Black August, the hunger strikes of 2013, the importance of organizing in our neighborhoods through prison bars and self-education. You can contact Mwalimu via JPay by searching for his state name, Terrence White, and the ID number AG8738. Or you can write him letters addressing the inside to Mwali Mushakur and the envelope to Terrence White, number AG8738, CSP Corcoran, P.O. Box 3461, Corcoran, California, 93212. And you can find links in our show notes to groups that he suggests that folks get involved with or follow, as well as the two sites that carry his writings most frequently. You can also hear two interviews from way back in 2013 that William did with former political prisoner and editor of California Prison Focus, Ed Mead, before and after the strikes. Um, you can find them by checking the show notes or searching the website for the name Ed Mead. Now a couple of announcements. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Jonathan Jackson at the Marin County Courthouse, as well as the assassination of his brother George at San Quentin Prison in California, and the subsequent uprising and state massacre at Attica State Prison in New York. Black August has been celebrated at least since 1979 to mark those dates with study, exercise, community building, sharing, and reflection by revolutionaries on both sides of the bars. In the last decade across Turtle Island, you've seen strikes and protests and educational events that take place around this time of the year as we flex our muscles. This year, you've heard us mention Jailhouse Lawyers Speak, that they're calling for weeks of action for abolitionism under the name Shut em Down 2021. You can find out more at jailhouselawyerspeak.wordpress.com and follow them on Twitter and Instagram, linked in our show notes, alongside links to this week's chat. You can also hear our interview with a member of JLS from earlier this year about the Shut em Down initiative or read the interview, also available in easily printable format, at our site and in the show notes. Another announcement, New African Prison Rebel and co-founder of the New African Liberation Collective and IDOC Watch organizer Shaka Shakur has been interstate transferred hundreds of miles away from his support network to Buckingham Correctional in Virginia. You may recognize the name of that prison. There was a call-in campaign this week focused on VA Governor Northam. Director of VA DOC Harold Clark, VA DOC Central Regional Director Henry Ponton, and Warden Woodson at Buckingham. This was in support of Shakur's hunger strike in protest of the transfer. His time in solitary prior in Indiana that resulted in having his prescription medications taken away. Him being moved into solitary at Buckingham with minimal hygiene and no personal materials. As noted in the transcript about his hunger strike at IDOC Watch's website, the transfer interrupts civil and criminal litigation Shaka Shakur has pending in Indiana, and has also caused him to be halfway across the country after his own surgeries, the loss of his family matriarch, as well as an aunt, and the hospitalization of his mother and other health hardships. You can find ways to support him and get involved via Virginia Prison Abolition, IDOC Watch, and New African Liberation Collective, all of which are linked in our show notes. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. I'll say, burn it down! 
Ingram Embers, anarchist perspectives from the territory currently occupied by the Canadian state. Find us wherever you get your podcasts or on the Channel Zero Network. Hi, I'm wondering if you could introduce yourself for the audience, maybe like your name, your location, if that's useful, any any pertinent information that will help the audience understand you. Well, my name is Imwalimu Siri Shakur, and I'm in Corcoran State Prison, where I've been for the last 17 years, 13 of which were in solitary confinement. But, you know, due to our uh, massive hunger strikes and challenging this legislature inside of prison, the bureaucrats decided to... Uh, let us out to the general population. Can you talk a little bit about some of your background, where you came from, how you became politicized, and how you identify politically now? Yeah, well, I came from uh, Los Angeles, California. You know, gang violence was in probably every neighborhood around the whole L.A. County area, as well as most of Southern California, but I grew up in a gang neighborhood. And not having really no political education and only knowing the street way of life, you uh, kind of navigated through it caught cases, you know, cases that you know will put you in prison. But once you come inside of here, you have older individuals from your same community and other communities around the country uh, who became politicized, and they became politically mature so they can re-educate, you know, others that come in. And for me, landing in prison uh, with the drug, you know, drug dealer mentality, gang mentality, criminal mentality all together, it, it made me, it put me in a a situation where I was always involved in physical combat with others, you know, people I knew from my area, and then, you know, we, we have race riots. So those types of things will put you in solitary confinement. And when you go to solitary confinement or you catch an infraction known as a shoot term, they'll place you around more politicized individuals who've uh, educated themselves, um, you know, studied their own history, studied politics, studied economics, to study a vast array of things. And being around those guys, that was the, the the program on the inside. So I was able to start educating myself. And I educated myself so much so that I developed it into my practice. And it gave me a discipline that became second nature to me. And once my mind started opening up to this new reality, I started seeing things more clearly. And I realized and understood why my community was the way that it was. It wasn't because we wanted to do these things. It was by design by those who oppress us and control us so that they can put us in their prisons and, and, and enact a modern-day slavery-type practice. Being in prison, that's exactly what it, what it is. You know, so that's what happened to me. And now, the more I still learn, the more I'm able to teach and, and hopefully stop others from making those same mistakes. And... If my teaching is correct the way it was with me, then we can stop this school-to-prison pipeline, is is what we say when you have a lot of people from inner city coming to prison, not knowing, you know, what to do with themselves. You know, they usually end up here. And we're trying to break that, break that curse and break those habits. A lot of people in the listening audience may not understand what you mean with talking about how the situation was set up, particularly at this time, like during you went in during the you know what could be called like the hate mass incarceration in the United right, States right. and if you could maybe break down since that you know you've been in for a while and and some things have changed greatly some things have stayed the same uh there's this guy named Biden I've heard about that uh still pretty prominent in politics that was pretty prominent in some of the political decisions that put a lot of people in particular black and brown folks behind bars at that time. Could you talk a little bit about that context? Yeah, well, in the inner cities, they flooded it with cocaine, you know, as if to say that the little progress we made in the 70s from the 60s uh, revolutionary era would quiet us and stop us, you know, from progressing as a people and as a culture. So you flood all the inner cities with these with this cocaine, okay? A lot of us partook in selling it, not knowing or really having a vast understanding of uh, just further destroying our community and our people. So, you know, we became hustlers in the drug game. Gangs were, you know, rapidly building and growing, and then they put guns on the streets. So now with these gun wars and these, these drug wars, basically, what the administration, I think, believed had it 
set up that way so that they can take taxpayers' money to build more prisons and create more laws to put us in and clearly show you the problems that are ha that they're happening in those inner cities. And they created it, you know. And when you when you study it, you see it unfold that way because the only ones being heard off into these prisons is us, black and brown people. You know, and the sentences are outrageous. With, without a murder, just for like selling small amounts of cocaine, you can get a lot of time, double digits, okay? And then they enacted other laws, like the three-strike law, you know, and, and made it seem like we were the, the worst people on planet Earth. And in all actuality, that's not really true. That's not really true. You know, if you wouldn't have flooded the inner cities with that cocaine, with, you know, and made it possible for us to have better quality education in our schools, made it affordable to go off to college and learn a, a higher uh, field of study so we can be successful in this country, we would have had more success. But, you know, the, the ratio of, you know, people black and brown playing sports was very limited. And that was the only ticket that I've seen out if you weren't being a drug dealer, you know. So that's why I say it was by design. When you study it, you see that that mass incarceration boom is still in effect right now, right? And and what we are doing is trying to challenge some of those laws and get them out of there because we recognize what they did. And with some of the laws changing, it's like they're admitting it that they did do this, and now it's time to make it right. So that's what I see. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. A part of the context that I have for you and why I was excited to have you on the show is um, because you have a long history of struggle alongside of other prisoners against unethical situations, against cruelty, against mass incarceration. One of the points in the struggle of prisoners that I've heard you refer to was participation in the hunger strikes um, against uh, basically unending use of the shoe or solitary confinement. Can you talk a bit about, people may have heard of the term SHU or um, secure housing unit. How does that differ from solitary confinement more generally? Is there a difference? Well, no, there's no difference. I mean, we we refer to solitary confinement as the ad, seg ad segregation, which is the ad admin, where they first put you before you get the SHU term. The, the the situation is the same, the 23 hours lockdown, except for once you once you go to the, sh the initial SHU, that's when you can have appliances like a TV or a radio, okay? In Aztec, you can't have those two things, but you can have everything else. You still go to yard uh, every other day for a few hours, and you're in a dog-like kennel-type cage where they put uh, a urinal so that you can use the restroom, but you have no contact with another human being. You can see them from cage to cage, um, but you can't contact them. You can't touch them. The only human contact you have is if you have a SEBI. So the practices are the same. Um, the length of time in solid in, sol in a ad seg is not as long as it is in shoe. Like I said, ad seg is like a, a, a pit stop before you get to the security housing unit. And within the security housing unit, it's not you can't have the type of things you can have on in the general population. Like you can't take college courses, you can't go to school, you know, you can't take a vocation. You can have a few books. Um, you can have uh, no tennis shoes. Just like uh, some type of some type of shoe that's that's not really designed to protect your feet, but this is so you can put on, so you can have like a shower shoe, but with a little bit more support. Uh, you could have no athletic shorts, no t-shirts. Um, you have to. We, we took like two pairs of t-shirts just to make a long sleeve t-shirt. Case was cold, so you couldn't have long. You couldn't have sweatsuits, thermals, beanies, nothing like that to keep yourself warm. It's a real inhumane practice to have. You you pretty much break a person down to nothing, and you put them in a cell where they're like I said, confined for 23 hours a day. And it was just because of those conditions, the small portions on the trays, uh, the lack of quality uh, health care, always being handcuffed every time you do come out the cell to go through a shower, which is like five minutes, or go to the if you're in Pelican Bay, then you don't you're not in a dog cage, you're just in a little cage right behind your cell, so you see nobody. You know, so, yeah, we we all came together talking through the doors, talking through the toilets to each other and decided to come up with a strategy to get up out of there, you know, to to, to uh, get released. And it, it worked because united we stood on a hunger strike and then we started challenging the, in, uh, the injustices that put you in there, like the gang validation, and then we started challenging the practices that they use 
to kick you in there. Like if you talk to another inmate who's a gang who's a gang member, then you get another point and that'll keep you in there longer. And mind you, you only go into a classification every six years to get, you know, um, to get considered to be released. So it, it was, you know, it was really inhumane. The practices were. Uh, and we just came up, you know, like I said, with the hunger strike strategy as well as challenging the rules in order to get up out of there. And for the most part, it worked. You talked about participating in hunger strikes against shoot containment. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the administration and gang status? The shoot, there's a term that you'll be able to come up with it, but, you know, basically where if you're assigned a gang status, because somebody else pointed at you, the only way in a lot of cases to get out of uh, the shoe at that point was to basically claim that someone else was a gang member and give false testimony in a lot of cases um, to be able to reduce shoe time. Is that does, is that a fair description? Is that what happens? Yeah. Well, what it is is the administration, they look at um, who they feel is against them as far as politicalness. If you're, like for us New Africans, I can speak on that. Um, we're not a gang. But being a politicized, conscious New African means you can challenge their, con- you can challenge your conditions and wake others up to that knowledge on how to do so. And what they do is they'll put that gang label on you because they put the gang label on the other ethnic groups. And it can stick with the other ethnic groups if you're a, a gang member that came from society and you come up inside of these prisons and you, you know, you group together and you, you form your structure. So what they do is they put that label on you so they can, they can get away with the title 15 law book that they write. They come up with these rules, just like the bureaucrats in society come up with rules uh, and different laws to get legislation passed. Okay, the, the bureaucrats in prison do the same and they get a book called the title 15 where it gives them the rights to, if whatever they consider gang practice, like reading certain types of books, certain type of cultural literature, a certain type of drawing depicting that literature, anything you read and study or practice, if they consider that gang participation, they'll slap you with that label, okay? And if you rack up, they give you points for everything you do, okay? If you speak the, the Swahili language, they say you're communicating in code, okay? So that becomes a gang point. If you exercise a certain way in military form, that shows unity. They look at that as gang participation with other gang members. So it's whatever little rules they can try to come up with to make stick on you, which gives them their little right to uh, hinder you. And once they have enough points, like three to four points, they, they can put you in solitary confinement indefinitely. And what it does is they give you an indeterminate shoe, which is only six months. But every six months, they just keep stamping it. So then you stay in there for years and years and years. And you only go to committee, the ICC committee, every six years if you have an indeterminate shoe. So that gives them the right to keep you in there. And then when you go to that committee, they stamp you again and say, well, we've seen him talking to another gang member. We shouldn't. He hasn't denounced his association. So, you know, those little things keep you in solitary for that length of time. And the only way to get out is parole. Uh, and if you debrief, go through the little processing of, of dry snitching or telling on other, you know, informing on others and work for them, or you die, you know. And we wanted to take that power back. So we all got together and decided, you know, look, let's come up with these strategies to do so. But it's a flawed system. We challenged it. It worked because we didn't have the uh, the political maturity to understand that in order to beat their system, we should unite. But once we developed that, we found those strategies to be significant in winning our freedoms from behind that wall. So now they can only use their shoe practices if you catch a shoe on the fence. You know, whatever they deem the shoe on the fence, like getting caught with a weapon or participating in, a, in some type of a riot or melee, you know, anything that assault on the staff, you know, anything that would warrant shoe placement. Mwalimu, so there was the, uh, just to make a point too on the, um, on the gang jacketing, and the files and the debriefing and everything. Like, if you get paroled out and, like, a lot of people are going to end up staying with their family because they don't have money. So if they can go anywhere, they'll they'll try to stay with their family. Oftentimes, right. the way that the California government defines gang membership, uh, there's a relationship to, like, they say, like, oh, it overlaps with family. So it seems like it complicates it, too, when you go and you stay in, in you know, like, your cousin's house or whatever, 
they are then associating with a known gang member. And this kind of, at least, I'm not sure if it still is the case, but I think in 2013 this was still the case. Gang injunctions would then come into play where um, maybe if, because you've been communicating with your cousin who's on the outside, when you get out, maybe you can't go to the neighborhood that your your cousin lives in because they're considered to be gang associated through family connections right. or whatever. Is that is that right? Yeah. Well, it's true, Steel, because, yeah, they can gang jack at you, but once they do background checks on your family and they see that they're, they're, they're not a, involved with the street gang life or anything like that, they'll back up, but they'll still watch you. But, you know, you, most people let their family, or their family already knows about them and what to expect in case they parole to a loved, in case you parole to a loved one's house. Now, if you go to your neighborhood and you are a member of a street gang, then they're gonna, then they, they're, the the parole department is gonna watch you a lot more because if that street gang is under any type of surveillance for any type of activities that they have, they're gonna see if you're participating in anything like that. And that's also avoidable. It's, it's all about you and what you want to do to integrate back in society. For me, I was working, went back to school, and, and living a productive life where they couldn't pinpoint me for doing things with, you know, known gang members from my area or anybody else I might have ran into that I knew. Because while they're watching me, they're seeing that, okay, he may be speaking to people, but he's not doing anything that we consider illegal or gang activity. So they won't push on you so hard. They'll give you a little leeway. But for those that do go back out there and do anything like that, you're just setting yourself up for failure. You know, surveillance capitalism, you see it all over now. they got cameras all on telephone poles and, and certain of the community uh, uh, areas where they can watch the neighborhood and see what they're doing and things of that nature. So the, the, the community is under surveillance, you know, normal people under surveillance. I mean, so they're watching everything you do, but it's up to you, you know, that individual on how well they want to be productive out there and what they want to do while they're out there. Yeah, what what you're describing though with the like the inside outside affiliations and the constant surveillance is counterinsurgency, right? Right, right, right. And they do that in here as well as out there. I learned that firsthand by being in the shoe and being investigated by ISU officers and IGI officers who are supposed to work with gang members in prison, but they're going out there to society and work on parole agents and other uh, sheriff departments that patrol certain gang neighborhoods, you know, and that's how I got arrested, actually. On three violations that I obtained, I was arrested by them, you know, and they didn't, I didn't commit a crime, but one of my violations, they put me back in prison for being out past curfew. You, because I stopped at a gas station before I got home, and then they were the ones harassing me, okay? Then I'm at home, you know, I'm, it's a decent hour, but they came to my house and said, well, you're living above your means. You know, it's just little chicken mm-hmm. things like that. It's the things that they do when you have that gang jacket on you. And like I said, it gives them that right because of their flawed law book that they put together that um, they target us, you know. During the last portion of our conversation, you were talking about the the prison strikes, the hunger strikes across California prisons that actually spread way beyond that um, around concerns of solitary confinement. And you talked about when people realized that when they were unified, they had a lot more strength. Can you talk about that sort of organizing, that inspirational moment of, and the hard work that you all put in to create negotiations and some sort of like de-escalation between different crews, whether they be specifically racialized crews like the Aryan Brotherhood, um, the sort of stuff that inspires people still from the Lucasville uprising and from Attica before it? Yeah, yeah. See, when you show a person the, uh, your purpose, and you you can sometimes take race even out of it and just sh- show the love for humanity. When you take a stand for others who are being oppressed, and you show them the conditions in which they're being oppressed, they tend to understand and say, hmm, that makes sense. You know, so what we was able to do was let them know that there's a bigger picture than this little bickering that we have going on for generations and generations. And... um when you show them that bigger picture and they see that, yeah, if we uh, unite with you all, whether our interests are the same or not, and we can reach the objective by doing so, then let's do it. And then the whole time while you're you're doing that, you still show them your correct views, your correct ideology, what you perceive. You show them the incorrect ways in which they're being treated by the government. You show them that... It's a class struggle and not a race struggle. You show them who 
Um, and you, you're using these teaching moments, you know, to show them that it's, it's the race case system was devised by the two-party government system to show you that, look, if you divide yourself from the Negroes and the Indians, then we'll give you special privileges. But they're not getting that special privileges. So now you show them that, look, you're serving your interests just as much as we do or, or we are. And if you believe in American values, you're going to lose because they're not going to treat you the way you think you deserve to be treated. And you can clearly see that with people that go off to war, you know. So when you show people where the wrong is at and who's responsible for the wrong, they'll lean more towards you. And that's what we were able to do with the other ethnic groups in, in California as well as when we got the word out to society and had a lot of white people, a lot of Mexican people, a lot of other ethnicities um, join forces with us to help us, you know, in solidarity to help us overcome the challenges that we were facing in here. And we had a lot of people from other countries, like mainly Europe, you know, that, that <clears throat> where there was a lot of civil unrest and a lot of organizations who had established the shelter, but they were poor people organizations because they realized that it was a class struggle. And that's how you win the masses over you know, a lot of times people just, they have a feeling, they have a thought. They just need to be pushed to exercise that thought and give in to that feeling. And when you show them that, you, and you, that you got that love and support for them, and they, they feel that strength, then uh, they tend to latch on to you. Was an outcome, actually, of, of those strikes, I know it led to higher court responses and admonition of the state of California for its practices, how have things changed because of that mass movement of people, and um, how has that that sort of like peace that was brokered and sort of reflection that it was a class struggle and not a race struggle? Um, where do, where does that seem to fit in the California system to you now? Well, now that they let us all out of solitary confinement, you know that was one win, and then they can only use the solitary confinement the shoe um, for if you catch a shoe. Uh, term, You know, it has to be a criminal infraction, just like if you're on the streets and you break a case. You know, I mean, you catch a case and you go to prison. They have to utilize it the way it was designed. So they can't use those practices no more. Also, the guards union took a hit because a lot of them can't work in the shoe no more and, and get that hazardous pay, which is like triple pay. So they, they lose out. The board of prison terms has said, you know what, we're going to have to start letting some of these people out of, out of prison and back into society so their laws have been changing. Since we've gotten into the general population and utilized our practices and shown them, you know, this revolutionary way of doing things, uh, we brought, we, when, when they implemented their own self-help groups, which are like robotic programs to teach you how to have common sense the way they want you to, you, you see how they're doing it and you change that narrative and create your own self-help groups, things that you know will really work. And you're working together with other ethnicities and you're, you're increasing the peace and showing this younger generation you've been misled, you've been misguided, you know, we're the ones who made mistakes and had the faults. It's time for us to change that. And when you do that, you see legislatures saying, okay, well, they know the truth now. They know what really happened. They know how the, the three strikes were devised. They know who pushed the crack, the cocaine into the neighborhoods. They're taking, we're taking the power back by realizing that there's a peaceful way to get things done. There's a peaceful way to bring these changes. And if you keep telling the truth, you take the power out of, of the 1% class's hands and you win more of the masses over because you make people who didn't know understand you know, by teaching them those truths. And, and then they research those facts on their own, and they're more willing to want to help you. So a lot of changes are still uh, are still needed, but we got the ball rolling. And that's one thing that I can say is happening right now throughout the California prison system.
So this year, jailhouse lawyers speak, which is a coalition, I think, like based around in prisons around the U.S., um, a lot in the south of the U.S., is calling for days of action and solidarity and education on the outside with folks struggling on the inside on August 21st and September 9th. And I'd like to hear later about Black August and about education and the 50th anniversary of uh, George Jackson's assassination and the, uh, you know, just how people participated in the Attica uprising also. But I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about this sort of, like, trajectory, like the importance of having people on the outside acting in solidarity and understanding the unity between inside and outside as well as the differences, and just to sort of, like, point to that trajectory of activity, like the inspiration of the hunger strikes in California that spread the movement in Georgia uh, in the early 2010s, the Free Alabama movement and the strikes that were happening in in, uh, in Alabama and, and Mississippi around that time and the sort of, like, chronology of struggle. Um, could you talk about the importance of inside-outside solidarity and, and the upcoming dates of action and education? Yeah, well, because the, the inside-outside solidarity is of paramount importance because we don't want separation. We don't want... Uh, the one percent class to think that uh, people in society look at us as bad people. You know, they need to understand um, that it's important to support us on the inside because we are the ones who will be fighting once we get out, or you know, we're the ones who are going to fight with them to help them challenge different conditions out there that are still oppressing them out there as as it, as it is in here. You know, it's, it should never be a divide. It should always be unity. You know, what we sparked in California by recognizing our conditions, we're glad that it trickled over into them other states because they were up against the same type of oppressive slave conditions. I mean, they didn't start in California with the three strikes, for example. They started, I mean, they started in California and you know, that action spread to other states and they just called it something different. But the conditions are still the same. You know, so um, the importance of, of, of knowing that will build that unity and people outside will see the importance of just, you know, stand in unity with us on the inside to get things done because it takes us all in order to beat back capitalism and imperialism, you know. So um, what, what, what we would love to see more of is um, a lot more changes being done in the Constitution, like a minute, third, you know, keeping those clauses there allows them to still keep those practices, those slave practices. And people on the outside need to really understand a lot more of what they're up against. And if they if they are working with anybody in here, we can always show them that look at these liberation schools teach education. It teaches you something that the American public school system didn't teach you. We teach the truth based on all cultures, how they've been oppressed economically, politically, militarily, and the the need to eradicate those backwards ways of thinking and doing because you know who established them. And if you know that, then you can fight them a whole lot easier. So we look forward to um, continuing, you know, our liberation schools and winning the masses over that way. We look forward to supporting you all out there, as well as I know you guys will um, look forward to helping us on the inside. And, yeah, we, we can talk about it a lot more the next time I get a chance to call. Thanks. Working with the inside and outside is, is the best thing possible so that we break away from that dividing line that they yeah. try to put there because they want to keep you separate. You know, unity in the masses is of, of, um, is of paramount importance if we want to go forward in this class struggle because we need to unite, helping each other with whatever we got going on that reaches a positive objective of change, you know. And like what you're doing now, this right here is unity in the masses. This builds solidarity. You know, this is reaches people so they can see their purpose. And if they need help with anything, and there's others who might have a, a, a semblance of how to make it happen for them, then, you know, by all means, you should you should always assist, you know. And, and that's what will keep the unity strong. You know, people always want to be able to lean on their comrades and loved ones. And, you know, sometimes other people have, you know, better programs or, or something else that's working that they might not have working. And, you know, you always want to help people so that they can achieve their goals just like, you know, you want to achieve your goals, you know. Would you say a bit about – so we're we're talking right now um, in August. It's the 50th anniversary of the Attica Uprising as well as the assassination of George Jackson, uh, which, as I understand, in 1979 began being practiced uh, mostly by – black radical prisoners and then by others in solidarity 
the practice of Black August. Can you talk a little bit about the, the practice, its importance to you, um, and also, like, a bit about the education and the liberation schools? Yeah, yeah. Well, the purpose of um, keeping the practice uh, going of Black August is what the month means to uh, new African revolutionaries who fought and gave their life to win freedoms that we have in here. They, you know, they put their life on the line to challenge these conditions. So the liberation schools from the onset is to teach that, you know, about our history, our cultural practices, because this is something that we didn't learn in school. And when you learn through the liberation schools, it allows you to go out there and um, not compete in the capitalist market, but understand what capitalism is all about and utilize your finances for socialist practices, you know, helping grow uh, black-owned businesses or other oppressed ethnic, ethnic groups in the community's businesses and uh, building that unity and solidarity because what you learn is that we all have shared cultural practices. In Howard Zinn's book, A People's History of the United States, you learn how the divided line was established and by whom. You learn the importance of solidarity and unity and how to help each other. Each one, teach one, practices come to mind, and you see the importance of doing so. So, yeah, this whole month, we pay reference to those who, who paved the way for us, basically, and uh, continue with this, that study, that practice. You know, the exercising is something we do in unity just to build strength, you know, build character release. So you, you mentioned, like, the practices and the importance of sharing this, you know, uh, learning and mentoring and study and focus during the period of Black August and also, like, redirecting funds back into socialistic endeavors. Could you talk a bit about about sort of the, the legacy for you of, like, some of the big ideas like and some of the big thinkers, like, like George Jackson, obviously, like comes to mind. His struggle, his writings have been like greatly influential to folks that are doing study behind bars. I know that you've you've done work on projects that have collaborated with George Jackson University. And also, I, I would like for you, if you if you're okay with it, to break down the term "New African," which you uh, define yourself as. I think some listeners may be unfamiliar with with that term and some of its lineage. Yeah, well, the new African term is your ideology. You know, we consider this our new Africa, being that we're descendants uh, of our ancestors who came over here as slaves. So we don't use the term African-American or black. or We try to refrain from those terms because those are the terms that the oppressor wants to call you, you know. And to see things from his way is just not the correct way. So that's why we call ourselves new Africans. It's, um, it's an ideology. And all ethnicities who are revolutionary nationalists um, should always refer to their self, uh, you know, in, in a way that they feel comfortable, not in a way like the oppressors feel like referring to them. And, you know, most of my role models, so to speak, yeah, George is one, Mao, Marx, Ingalls, uh, Amakar Cabral, Patrice Lumumba, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, all those who took a liberation stance, Che Guevara, you know, to challenge oppression. And, and, and unite the people and challenge the conditions that were oppressing them, not just the people. Those who sacrificed their life paved the way for us. You know, and their spirit lives on in the hearts and minds of all of us who continue to do the same because, as you can see, the problem still exists. I, I do like Huey's concept as well because creating a party, which, you know, Lenin, uh, Lenin spoke about, is a, a party or a self governing organization of the people. You know, that's basically what communism is. And socialism is your economic practices. So it, it works in hindsight as long as you're always keeping the people in mind. You know, when you create programs for the people, they're, they're programs designed to help further the people along and keep them uh, thinking about self-sufficiency because that's what it's all about. You know, you don't need to compete in the capitalist market work your way up the capitalist chain because you'll never make it to the top. You know, uh, in understanding that, you want to wake up the minds of others who don't yet know that. And that way they won't be, you know, running around like dogs chasing their tails, so to speak, lost, you know, and, and caught up. Um, you're just trying to make ends meet. They'll make things They'll make things better for themselves. Okay? So you, you were just telling me about the liberation school. Can you talk a bit about 
just about what you all do and what the idea is? Well, okay, yeah, see, with us, it's always about need. So as far as, like, the liberation schools, we try to bring the material, the cultural material, historical material, that where where we read it and studied it and it, it, we practice our, our way of life like our ancestors did. And every program we create is a program of need. So when we grab the certain books, like, for instance, um, Chancellor Williams has a book called The Destruction of Black Civilization. And it tells you how it was destroyed in Africa. Okay, then he tells you, he does a sequel called Part 2, The Rebirth of African Civilization. And that tells you how to build these self-sufficiency uh, programs that are designed to uh, allow you to implement socialist practices that are, you know, programs of need that uh, people have so that, you know, they can continue to, to raise healthy families. You know, and like, for instance, we created one program, um, we, 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 I have to send you a pamphlet on it so you can get the in-depth details of it. But like, for instance, one of them was like building a community grocery store. And let's say, for instance, if I have enough finances to rent a space and build a grocery store, um, I use, uh, a comrade or a friend in the community that has their own, um, construction company. And I, I spend monies with them who's not going to charge me a lot to build the grocery store. Okay, the grocery store, all the stuff that I'm, I'm selling in the grocery store is like people, let's say for instance, about four or five, uh, people on my, on my street who have organic fruits and vegetables. You know, the soil is, is ripe for planting and growing foods and vegetables. So I take all their groceries, all, all their stuff. I pay them, you know, what they want for this reasonable price. Then I turn on and sell it to other people, you know. And what you see is the practices of, of implementing that, and everybody has enough. Everybody is, is, is not in need, and the concept continues. And you can use it with other things, like a clothing store. You know, I have a, per, a friend of mine who's a good artist, so I might want to, you know, go to another friend of mine who has a linen shop and buy some linen and then take my other friend's art and then transform the art onto the clothes and start a clothing line. You know what I mean? And go to another friend of mine who owns like a store that's similar to Walmart and then put my stuff in his store and have him sell it for a price so that everybody has enough money, everybody is um, is working and contributing to each other's businesses and we're growing and thriving to those businesses and living off of that. You know, those socialist practices are what's missing in the communities. And if there is a lot of, you know, we call them mom and pop spots, you know, the community businesses, Thriving those businesses to grow, you know, allows for a safe environment, you know, in a thriving community. And that's one of the things we teach in the liberation schools. You know, one of the ways that we do things to implement socialist practices. And um, other things, you know, people get other things out of it, you know, because we don't just study New African history. We study all oppressed people's history, you know, Mexican history, First Nation people's history, which they call them Indians or Native Americans because, you know, that was all of Central and South America. Um, we study, um, you know, we, we study American history, but then we, 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 when you study other cultures' history, you fill in the, pretty much the gaps that's left out of American history where all of us played a part in history. You know, and we fill those in. You know, we study theology, break down the different religions, show how different cultures uh, worship God in different ways. Uh, some comrades are Muslim, so they can talk about that. Some comrades are Christian, uh, Hebrew, Israelites, Jude, uh, Judas. You know, I've heard all different types. And, you know, we just we study all the sciences that we can and, and some of the arts, you know. And there's people who are more more well-diverse in languages and in other forms of study than, than a lot of others. So they do, they you know, they study on an advanced level, and then some study on a beginning level. And as long as you can grasp the concepts and implement them into your practice, it'll change your way of thinking and how you relate to each other. You know, when you see that each other has a need uh, and you learn about core value systems and you try to complement those needs based on that core value system. So... To go back to the example that you gave of, of folks starting markets and um, trading with each other and using each other's resources and such, how does the socialist approach not allow for the recreation of a bourgeoisie within that community? Certain people have access to certain resources, and if they continue to hold on to it, um, doesn't that just reproduce a class dynamic? 
Yeah, if you can't if you can't show people the the importance of the socialist practice, then yeah, they'll stay they'll stay with a bougie mind, and that's middle class mainly because they try to reach for that one percent class. A lot of them don't make it. So if they want to continue to reach for it like that, then you have to just let them do what they do. You know, but for those who see the importance of the socialist practices, you you, you continue to welcome them in and. Show them the importance of sharing those resources because you don't want to be materialistic. If you be, if you become too materialistic, then the capitalist mind has has engulfed at you, and you continue to, you start thinking like the one percent, which is what they they want. You know, you see it on the TV screen all the time. The lavish lifestyle. They want to showcase that so that you can think that that's success, and it's really not. You know, um, you know, I was uh, um, I was in the streets. And I was a hustler, and I used to think that that was the way to be successful when I realized after studying my history when I came to prison that all I'm doing is stepping on my own people, um, hurting my own people, and creating genocidal practices as well as mentocidal practices by destroying people's mind, making them think that this is the way to be, and it's not. So you have to use uh, a, a, a practice that we call eradicating backwards and unprogressive ways of thinking and, and behaving. And... When you read and study more, you see that that's the most important thing to do, you know. And when you apply that mentally, you have to encourage others to do the same. But, yeah, if you, you can't reach everybody. So if you can't, you just got to let them, you know, pretty much fall to the wayside. I'd love to hear more about um, your ideas on, for instance, in your study group, in Corcoran, where, like, people have limited access to material resources. There's, you know, the the... Literally, the institution is there to keep people separate from each other and monitor their relationships. Sharing knowledge is definitely an aspect of of socialism. But is there um, are there other practices or, or sort of like ways that people relate to each other that sort of reflect on this, the socialist practice that you're talking about? Yeah, well, us who come from the inner city, you know, we've we've um, swallowed a lot of our differences, and we see that there's a common goal, and that common goal is. You know, creating, keeping, keeping it peaceful on the prison yards and, uh, not let anyone disturb that peace so that we can make it back to society where our families and our community needs us. So we can undo the damage that we did with, you know, the, the selling of drugs and the gang banging and the, you know, things like that. So we pretty much understand our conditions and we know that we are our own liberators. So we fight to do just that. You know, we've already, because of our agreement to end all hostilities, We've all already got football tournaments going, basketball tournaments, softball tournaments, handball tournaments, things like that. We share in the practices of implementing the self-help groups. You know, we, we know how to build better men. We know how to interact with each other, to help each other, you know, thrive and, and overcome any injustices that uh, come our way. So we help each other with law, law work and stuff like that, filling out 602s, medical forms, anything like that to show and build unity, which helps with the solidarity. So coming across those lines, youngsters coming in here who have a different mindset, they see that, and then they realize, wait a minute, we thought it was like, you know, negative and violent, and we show them, no, this is why it was violent at first. It was the CEOs behind starting all that. You know, and then, of course, when there's bloodshed, it's hard to stop it, but we show them the importance of building that unity and why, you know, we're, we're resorting to a different way of doing things. And they're starting to relate to that more. So it, it's, it is a lot of action. We didn't t- we're trying to take the hands out of the CEOs slowly but surely. I mean, we're up against a California Guard Union that's real big and powerful, you know, but, you know, we're not going to let that dis- discourage us. We're going to keep doing the best that we can so that we can overcome this and, you know, get these laws to change, get these parole boards, hopefully with people from the community on them, they would have more sympathy towards us and let us out instead of believing in capital punishment. But, yeah, it, it's, it's still a work in progress, but it's working. You know, it's working in a good way, so much so that the governor is letting people off death row and letting them trans- transition into prison so they can function in a normal environment so hopefully they can get a parole board they, or, or win their case in court. You know what I mean? So I guess a specific que- question, again, about the place that you're being held, or at least the state, so in, in terms of the the demonstrations that are being called for by JLS that, that we've talked about or mentioned before um, between August 21st and September 9th, uh, asking for folks on the outside to spread the abolitionist message and work with comrades and connect with comrades behind bars, 
I was wondering if you could talk about the some of the issues that spe- are specific to the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation System uh, where you're currently being held and um, look, any sort of insights on what you would like folks on the outside to be working on or, or, or like programs that they could be coordinating with based on the, co- the conversations that you're hearing and the reality on the ground where you're at? Well, where we're at, um, if comrades on the outside were building liberation schools, that would be of paramount importance because now they're educating themselves on the need and the importance of transforming the inner cities into um, positive places, getting rid of all the negative things. And that's mainly what we're doing in here because our self-help groups, we're, we're finding needs and trying to meet those needs. And what the state does is they want to create self-help groups that the prison board will accept so they can transition you back into society and be a robot, basically for them. And we don't want that. That's not therapeutic programming. You know, rehabilitation is people who want to change, and they know what they want to change. And if you create um, certain types of programs that help that change prosper and thrive, then, you know, that's what's needed. And that's what we're trying to do. What, what outside comrades can also do is work with organizations that are already doing things in prisons, whatever it may be. You know, if it's creating newsletters, newspapers, uh, podcasts, whatever it is, so that, you know, people in here can let you know what's going on and you can find ways to help that to bring, to bring about those changes. That's what's needed. We really would like to see people from the community on these parole boards instead of, you know, ex-police, DAs, and, and people in, in, the, in the legislative who only want to control us all. You know, we don't want to see them because they don't really want to help you. You know, if they help you transition to society, then they don't have a job. They have a job as long as prisons stay full. So that's basically what's needed. And, like, are there any sort of organizations that you want to name that um, folks could get involved in? Like, you were one of the founders of the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee, so I don't know if that's one that, that you'd want to name or uh, Oakland Abolition or any other any other sort of groups. Yeah, yeah. I walk as always, um, whatever state you're in, whatever city you live in, there's a chapter, and we're, we're trying to create more chapters. But, yeah, I walk as a good group to get involved with because they're, they're abolitionists and activists, and a lot of them have other professional fields where they can – they can utilize those tools to help, you know, uh, transition us out into society and create safe space for us to be involved in community work. Um, they challenge legislature. You know, Initiate Justice is another organization that they really challenge legislature and try to get um, their, their, their guidance senators and city council members to pass certain laws that will let us get out of prison earlier than what is expected. You know, um, you've got critical resistance. They're they're pretty big and they work to um, abolish prisons altogether. But there are a lot of a lot of them are activists. You got California Prison Focus. Uh, there are some other organizations out there in society in different states. I can't think of them all right now. But any organization that's working with inside people to make conditions better on the inside, as well as you know, transform those communities into positive places like the Malcolm X grassroots movement um, in in the South. You know, those are organizations you want to be a part of, you know, and we have a lot of organizations that we've established, like the Revolutionary International Black Panthers Party. That's an organization that builds liberation schools. You know, Prison Lives Matter is a newly organization, just like Jailhouse, Jailhouse Lawyers, where we're trying to, you know, continue to connect ourselves to these other prison plantations throughout this country where we continue to develop consciousness through our education and um, our revolutionary theory. We can apply that to practice so that we can continue to grow and thrive as a class, not just as a nation, but as a class of all ethnicities and um, struggle to win our freedoms. You know, you have to liberate the mind first before you can liberate the body. You know, and that's something that I always tell people. So, yeah, that that's something that people can get involved with. And if if they're not working with anybody on the inside, they can always, you know, go to my website and contact me. 
um, go to other comrades who might have websites and contact them directly so that that way we can, you know, help them get that extra push they might need to get involved in something. Can you say what the what website publishes your writings? Uh, yeah, I got um, I got two different websites. One's a, a pen pal website, and it's called Wire of Hope. You can go to um, wireofhope.com slash prison pen pal uh, Terrence White, and you'll see some of my writings on there. Um, my comrade, she put that, that website together in order to establish relations, you know, not so much as romance. If that happens, it's, that's a good thing, but to, you know, get us a voice out there as well as have people in the community connect with some of us on the inside so that they can work with us with doing positive things out there. And then I got a, my own website is a, a com right slash ajamawatu. Of course, you got to go to the HTTPS dot dot right slash right slash first, and then, you know, the rest of it, ajamawatu dot wixsite dot com slash uh, Ajamu Watu. Ajamu means he who fights for what he wants, and Watu means people. So if you put that together, it's saying he who fights for the people. It's why any word, and you'll see a lot of my writings. My writings are mainly about education, um, how to build and create self-sufficiency programs, how to develop political thought, how to apply revolutionary theory to practice, and never, one thing I always tell people is never be embarrassed if you go through the political um, immaturity stage because that's a given. You know, you have to develop your own um, way of doing things based on your understanding. You know, there's no big needs, there's no little use, but as long as you are studying cultural history, politics, economics, um, African history, you'll see the holes in American history and you'll be able to see the lies that they put out there. You know, a lot of the reading material that we read is like um, Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States of America, which shows you how the 1% class divided the rest of us in the 99% and how they're continuing to exploit us through their capitalist system. You know, and the more you read and learn and study, the more you your mind will open up so you'll see where there's a problem and you'll want to challenge that problem any way you can, as long as it warrants success. You know, and I will always encourage people to do that. And Walimu, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank okay. you. I'm still learning, you know. I guess it's, we're all no learning, problem. right? Yeah, well, we're all alive and learning. It took me a while to pronounce them all right, too. You know, it's it's funny because in the Swahili dialect, the A's are pronounced like E's, and the E's are pronounced like, the I's are pronounced like E's. So it's backwards for the English vowel sound. You know, uh, the U is pronounced U. You know, the uh-huh. M is pronounced um, you know, so it takes a while, but once you get the hang of it, it'll flow like water. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I guess it's just about, it's about practice. And practice. Yeah, that's all. That's <laughs> Comrade, all thank you so much for having this conversation. I really, I really appreciate it, and I really value um, you taking the time and making the effort to get in touch and be in touch about this. And, um, yeah, I wish you total solidarity, and take care of yourself. Keep in touch. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you for having me, man. It's always a pleasure talking to you, comrade. You know, and people of like mind, in order to go forward is always a beautiful thing. You know, I, I enjoy meeting new people. I enjoy working with people and helping them out the best that I can. You know, each one, teach one is something that we have to continue to do. And uh, can't stop, one stop is something we have to continue to be mindful of. So, yeah, I'm always here for, for you all as well. You know, I thank you and appreciate you all so much. It's always a pleasure. Follow us on social media by visiting tfsr.wtf slash links. You can also support our ongoing transcription efforts, which get topical and timely anti-authoritarian, anti-capitalist, and all the other good antis texts into a format for easier digestion for folks with hearing difficulties for whom English is not their first language, easier mailing into prisons, easier translation, as well as searching by search engines by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash tfsr or making a one-time or recurring donation or purchasing t-shirts stickers or other merch and more info on that can be found at tfsr.wtf slash support and if you want to hear us up on your local community or college radio station you can find more info at tfsr.wtf slash radio this is the final straw and i'm bursa goodness 
This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.